I'm excited to talk with you today about mutation, but before we jump into our journey of how we can determine impacts of different types of mutations on gene sequences, I want to actually begin with a bit broader picture so that we can set the stage for um, disentangling the varying ways in which DNA can DNA sequences can change so we can see changes in genotype that are not just caused by mutation. So I want to tell you a story about post-World War Japan. This is a picture of Hiroshima after very shortly after the atomic bomb. And as you might guess, this was a very war-torn area. Um, it had really taken a hard hit and individuals Individuals are already always impacted as a product of systemic ac actions. So people in uh, post-World War II, Nagasaki and Hiroshima were very immunosuppressed. There was an increase in disease and of course environmental degradation. Um, riverbanks were collapsing and farmland was becoming useless. And as you might guess in that environment, uh, the spread of infectious disease uh, became prevalent. Anytime we see a war-torn area or an environmentally um, degraded area, we see mixing of fresh water with wastewater. And because of that, disease becomes a very common thing, and particularly um, diarrheal disease. Bacterial dysentery became a quite a huge problem. And as all of you know from the studies that you've done in lab, Shigella dysenteriae is the bacterium that causes that disease. What happened was that um, this uprising of bacterial dysentery was found uh, to be treatable and sulfa drugs were prescribed to treat it. Um, and of course, those who could access drugs and those who were more privileged were able to, um, to gain treatment for this infection. But in 1949, the incidence of the disease began to rise again, and it was found that sulfa drugs were no longer effective. So primary strains causing the disease were found to be resistant to sulfa drugs. Doctors then started prescribing other antibiotics, things like streptomycin and chlorophenicol, um, and those were effective. However, in 1955, a strain was encountered that responded to no known antimicrobial therapy. Um, and a woman who died from that um, was autopsied, and she was actually found to have microbiota that were also resistant to those antibiotics. So wait, what? <laughs> this is pretty crazy, because what this meant was that um, in the course of infection, over the course of only weeks, the bacteria that were resistant, that, that were causing the disease, the Shigella dysentery, bacteria were actually um, in some way transferring that resistance to the microbiota. This is crazy because this means that more than just mutation or slow genetic drift was causing change to the genotype of these bacteria. So this is when um, researchers started to think about in the, the mid 20th century, this idea that mutation is not the only way in which genotype can change. So we begin our conversation by looking at mutation, but we do so within the backdrop of recognizing that that bacteria can change not only through mutation, but also through recombination. And when I say that, I should also say that pathogens can change via mutation and recombination. Um, this is something that we're thinking a lot within reference to not just bacterial infection, but also viral infection. We, we can see viruses change ra rapidly through not just mutation, but also through things like reassortment and recombination. So the rapid change in genotype is generally attributed to something besides mutation. We're going to begin our journey by thinking about mutation. And we can define it. We've defined it in lab. You've seen it before. A stable and heritable change passed vertically from one generation to another. Um, a change that is heritable in the nucleotide base sequence. Now, this can be a spontaneous mutation. We know this can happen because we know, remember, that DNA polymerase can make mistakes. We know that it's very rare that it does make mistakes where we we see that spontaneous mutation, but we know that in one in every million or uh, 
even billion, we can see that that can happen. Um, and we can see that in the absence of an added chemical that might cause mutation, we can see that it spontaneously occurs. We also recognize that mutation can be induced. So within the presence of chemicals, it's interesting that we talked about wartime um, Japan in World War II. Well, in World War I, we were famous for using things like the nitrogen mustard. These are chemicals that can induce mutation. So mutagens are the name that we give to those chemicals. So these are two ways that we can see mutation occurring. Now we can see two different types of mutation. These can be transition or transversion mutations. And in the pre-party, you were asked to think about, um, the earlier part of the pre-party, you were asked to think about the base pairing rules. And hopefully you drew what it looks like when guanine pairs with cytosine or when adenine pairs with thymine. This is a pretty rudimentary drawing that I've just done on my Ink2Go program, but I'm what I'm hoping you're seeing, and what I also hope that you saw when you did this on your own, um, is the nature of the hydrogen bonds between G and C and A and T. So up top, of course, you'll recognize that there are three hydrogen bonds, so that must be guanine pairing um, with a cytosine. So this on the left is cytosine, guanine on the right, of course, a purine. Noticing then that the hydrogen bond donor is the amino hydrogen, and then the um, keto or oxo group here being the acceptor, and then again donor, acceptor, uh, donor, acceptor, and we're seeing that three hydrogen bonds forming there versus the two that we see between an A and a T, so the hydrogen bond, or bond donor here um, and the donor there, acceptor there, the nitrogen. So recognizing how the hydrogen bonding works. This is really important when we think about how it can go wrong <laughs> when we see tautomerization happen and how that actually can lead to mutation. Um, so for example, what we can see um, is a rare uh, tautomerization in guanine. So guanine can actually undergo a shift um, in which this um, ketone can become an enol. So this can actually, let's show this happening to the best of our ability. So when the tautomer forms, I'm just gonna get rid of this because this won't happen. So um, what can occur is that this keto, so this, uh, the keto then becomes an enol This is rare, but it can occur. And so what we see happening there is suddenly we have two hydrogen bond donors and no acceptor. And so the um, guanine becomes much less likely to want to pair with um, its proper partner, the cytosine, and check it, it becomes much more likely to want to pair with thymine. So when this tautomerization occurs, you can see how DNA polymerase just gets confused. It thinks that it wants to pair this guanine with a thymine. It thinks that's right. So we get the, these G to T mispairs that can occur as a result of the tautomerization. So that hand drawing really makes it a lot easier to see what goes wrong when a guanine tautomerizes forming the enol and how it mispairs with a thymine. Now, that has a name. We call it a transition mutation. Um, that terminology comes from the fact that in its normal form, guanine pairs with cytosine. Um, cytosine is a pyrimidine. When guanine tautomerizes and it mispairs with a thymine, the thymine is also a pyrimidine. So even though there's a mispair happening and where a cytosine would normally be incorporated, a thymine is incorporated, both cytosine and thymine are pyrimidines. So this is a pyrimidine for a pyrimidine swap. So the, the what would normally be a cytosine in that position became a thymine, pyrimidine for pyrimidine. This is a transition mutation. That's different from a transversion mutation. A transversion mutation would occur when um, this guanine mispairs pairs with an adenine. Whoa, hello. That's a big deal, right? Because that would actually form a big blip in the DNA because you'd have two purines 
pairing with one another. That's called a transversion mutation because in that case, what should have been a pyrimidine became a purine. So that's the difference between a transition and a transversion mutation. Now, another important thing to remember is that this takes two generations to really manifest. Because remember, in the first generation, what occurred was just a mispair. So as the DNA polymerase is raging down and creating at the replication fork these new strands, the leading and lagging strand, what we saw happening was that a thymine, again, got incorporated where a cytosine should have been first generation progeny form, and it's just a G to T mispair. It's possible that a mispair um, repair enzymes could find this. However, if the guanine stays tautomerized, they're not likely to find it because they think it looks right, right? It looks like it should pair that way. So then in that case, when replication occurs again and we go to the second generation progeny, the thymine accurately pairs with an adenine, and so the second generation progeny, we see a stable mutant. We call this a GC to AT transition mutation because in the wild type, we recognize that this pair was a GC. In the mutant, it's an AT. It was a transition mutation because what was a cytosine became a thymine. So now um, we have that lingo at our fingertips and we can practice. So this is a sequence that is a region of a Lux E gene. Um, remember the bioluminescence capacity is, is attributable to a Lux, uh, the Lux operon. So what we're seeing going on here is that um, I'm giving you the coding strand of DNA. You've become pretty familiar with looking at that. Good job with your GenBank uh, navigation. So you've got this coding strand. This is the um, transcription start site. Uh, so we recognize that the RNA would begin being formed here. Um, once we have the RNA, the only difference between what we're seeing here and the RNA would be that U's would replace T's. So we would be able to recognize the, um, the AUG start codon by looking for the ATG, ATG downstream from the ribosome binding site. Here it is, the Shine Delgarno, the ribosome binding site, that um, really uh, purine-rich se sequence, scan down from there, and there we have it. Um, the AUG start codon, right, in the RNA, that would be AUG. And our task here now is to understand what change we would see in the um, RNA codon and in the protein product if this G tautomerized at some point during replication um, and mispaired with uh, a T. So if that did occur at some point in the gene, what, what would be the impact? So we, we can do this relatively easily um, because we recognize that we found the ATG start codon and that set the reading frame. So now we can read our codons from there on down. We know AUG, ACU, ACU, oh, two in a row, uh, UUA, uh, UUA, oh, check it. It occurs in the most five prime position of the codon is that likely to cause a problem? Think for a minute. So it looks like G-A-U. Okay, cool. So um, in the wild type, so wild type, we would have um, G-A-U. So that's wild type. And then in the mutant, it looks like what we're going to get there, G mispaired with the T, and then T properly paired with an A. So this, what would have been a G, becomes an A. So in the mutant, we now have AAU. So this PowerPoint pen is not my faves. But that's what we're seeing in the mutant. Um, so a GC to AT transition mutation. So now all we have to do is use our code on usage table to look this up. Um, GAU, AAU, I asked you to think about it. Is that likely to cause a big problem? 
you betcha, because rather than being in that most three prime position of the codon, it's in the most five prime position. So we think that's going to cause um, a change in the amino acid that you would get incorporated there. Let's pause and take a moment to look at our codon usage table. Great, so just looking at our codon usage table then, um, GAU aspartate becomes AAU asparagine, we call it. This is what we call a missense mutation, meaning that there's a change in the amino acid as a result of the change in the codon. So some language that might make, help you make sense, um, pun intended, uh, of what you just experienced um, is that a missense mutation is when um, the change in the DNA due to mutation, due to a small point mutation, one base pair being changed. Um, if it's a missense mutation, that means one amino acid becomes another, so two different amino acids. Uh, nonsense means that it goes to encoding for a stop codon. Oftentimes, nonsense mutations, particularly if they have an early or mid gene, will be null or knockout mutations, causing complete inactivation of that gene. Um, you can also see silent mutations. And and those are when, due to degeneracy, you actually see the same amino acid being incorporated, um, regardless of the fact that there was a change. And typically that occurs when we're in the um, most three prime position of the codon. Another thing that can happen is that occasionally, on occasion, and sometimes this is induced by mutagens or sometimes it happens spontaneously, the um, DNA polymerase act enzyme actually slips on the replication fork. That sometimes occurs when there's a string, like a long string of adenines in a row um, that might cause slippage. And so what, what that can um, cause is really quite deleterious, very harmful. So if you imagine that slippage work to occur when this gene was being replicated and um, the entire G was skipped, it was just missed, that that would actually completely shift the reading frame. So what that would mean is that now this AUA would be the next codon and every single codon on downstream would be shifted. This is called a frame shift mutation. So when we think about that, I'll pose the question, is this likely to be a null or knockout mutation? And let you ponder that. The very last thing that I want to talk about in this mini lecture is um, a phenomenon called transposons. Transposons are literally jumping genes. And transposons um, actually encode for their own movement um, into and out of a uh, a region of DNA. They can be simple insertion sequences that just code for movement, or a transposon can actually contain extra genes. Check it, right? A transposon could actually contain extra genes. So imagine if a transposon jumps out of one spot on a plasmid or a genome and into another spot and it carries antibiotic resistance genes, you got it. That's the making of our plasmids, those multi-resistant um, plasmids that we've seen with seven or eight resistance genes on them. So these are called composite transposons when they carry um, other things, um, and they can sometimes even carry things like transcription termination sites, stop codons, they can interrupt genes. So you can see how in this case, if a transposon encodes for its own movement and it wants to enter right here, well, it's encoded for the clipping um, and it always clips with sticky ends. These are called sticky ends because uh, notice that this is a single stranded region of DNA. Uh, it's got all its bases going, well, I'm sticky, I want a hydrogen bond with something. Um, and then the transposon can insert in between there. 
oh, but notice this. It inserts at the end, no, it, like it inserts at the end of where the sticky ends are. So then these get filled in. So you can actually trace where a transposon has inserted because you can look for the direct repeats because once this gets fixed, this sequence of DNA right here is going to be identical to the sequence on this side, right? So there's going to be a direct repeat occurring to either side of where a transposon has inserted. So we can actually look for uh, where transposons have inserted by looking for incidences of direct repeats. So this certainly can wreak havoc. It can interrupt genes. It can insert extra genes. It can insert extra stop codons. Um, it can insert extra promoters. So there's a lot of impacts um, to genotype from transposon movement. We're going to call that a wrap for now, um, and you're going to do some activities.